Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I want to welcome you to the IFAM series today. Uh, for anyone, and I'll say this afterwards again, anyone joining Zoom, uh, please use your Q&A, not the chat, to pose any questions. We'll make sure to repeat them. Um, it is really a pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Danielle McCarthy. Um, as a representative of the Medical Faculty Council, this is really a joint presentation by the Medical Faculty Council and IFAM. Um, Danielle McCarthy is an Associate Professor in Emergency Medicine and the Vice Chair of Research. Uh, she is really one of our own. She did medical school here and then got her master's degree here and we were able to retain her as an emergency physician uh, and health services researcher uh, at Northwestern. We're very lucky to have her. Her work focuses, and we'll hear a lot about this today, primarily on doctor-patient communication, um, especially in the emergency setting and health literacy. Her more recent research has focused on risk communication about opioids and improving communication about diagnostic uncertainty. She is involved in um, a lot of research missions. In, she has over uh, 90 peer-reviewed publications. Uh, she's part of multiple federal grants, including the Pepper Center grant here at Northwestern. And she's really been recognized with many distinctions, including being a role model in the ER, receiving multiple teaching awards, and also nationally being recognized in many ways, including uh, serving on the DSMB uh, for the National Institute of Drug Addiction. So I'm really excited to hear your talk today on diagnostic and uncertainty in emergency medicine. Great, Ryan's just going to get us uh, set up here with the, the screen share for the Zoom participants. Um, thanks for that introduction, Daniela. We good. Yep. Okay. Great. So um, as Daniela said, I'm going to be talking today about diagnostic uncertainty in emergency medicine. Um, I don't have any conflicts to disclose. Uh, my current funding is from ARC and from the NIA. Um, and to provide an outline of what we're talking about, first I'm going to talk kind of broadly about uncertainty in emergency medicine, and then dive into the bulk of the talk about uh, an ARC grant that we had focused on developing communication strategies for talking to patients about uncertainty. And finally, I'm going to close with talking a little bit about uh, the difference between diagnostic uncertainty and diagnostic error, which is a little bit of a hot topic in emergency medicine right now. So uncertainty is having a, having a moment right now. Um, the, the word of the year, um, sorry, we're going to move this. The word of the year in, in 2020 in this New York Times headline, the word of the year was uncertainty. And I think that was largely driven by COVID. Um, there was sort of an increased consciousness among the, the media and the public that there was uncertainty in medicine. Um, and there've been a number of books that have come out on that, more articles published in the, the medical literature as well. But this is not something that's necessarily new to us who practice medicine. Um, this concept of uncertainty in medicine dates back uh, to the 1800s, as you'll see here from this quote by Sir William Osler. Um, Sir William Osler is one of the founding fathers of internal medicine, and he practiced in the late 1800s. And he said, medicine is a science of uncertainty and an art of probability. And the picture you see here is a taxonomy of uncertainty in medicine by Paul Hahn, who's one of the current leading scholars on uncertainty in medicine. And as you can see, uncertainty kind of spans the whole array of topics in medicine. There can be um, uncertainty related to diagnosis, um, as you see here, all the way through existential uncertainty. 
And some examples of this, for example, in the context of cancer, uh, if somebody finds out they have cancer, there may be uncertainty initially about the type of cancer, if it's benign or malignant, what the treatment might be. But on the other end of the spectrum, the individual with that new diagnosis is certainly experiencing some uncertainty about what does this new diagnosis mean for me and for my life, my day-to-day, -day, my future. For our talk, we're going to be focused specifically on diagnostic uncertainty, which is the lack of a definitive diagnosis to explain the cause of a patient's symptoms. And in the emergency medicine literature, largely when this was looked at historically, uh, the only articles that existed on uncertainty in emergency medicine were from, from a physician's lens. They were largely focused on how do we as emergency physicians make decisions in the setting of uncertainty with incomplete information? How do we tolerate the uncertainty that exists in our decision-making and in our, in our workspace? But they really didn't incorporate the patient perspective at all. Going back about six or seven years, um, a colleague of mine in Philadelphia, Kristen Rising, was starting her research career focusing on the topic of EV recidivism. There are about 150 million emergency department visits a year, uh, 350 million acute care visits, and about 6% of those result in a repeat visit or a bounce back to the emergency department. So Kristen was diving in on this and trying to figure out why are people returning? What's going on? And she did a bunch of qualitative studies and in different settings with different patients, with different methodologies over and over again, this theme kept coming up, that the patients had uncertainty, and it was fear and uncertainty about their condition that was driving them to the emergency department in the first place, and that was causing them to bounce back. And what we have is that the patients experience a symptom, um, and they don't know what it means. And they start thinking about medical words that they know or they've heard of. They start thinking, could this be a heart attack? Could this be cancer? Could this be a stroke? And they're on a quest to answer those questions. And that's what drives them to come to us in the emergency department. And sometimes we have cases that are really straightforward as, as the ED docs in this room will know. You know sometimes we see um, an ankle fracture, sometimes there's a clear cut cellulitis or skin infection. But a lot of the times we have a symptom and we don't have an answer. We do our exams, we sometimes bring in consultants, we can rule out things that are immediately life-threatening and dangerous, but we don't always have an answer. And we often send people home without an answer. This is problematic for patients because uncertainty is distressing. And they have specifically come to us seeking care to reduce their uncertainty. Everybody has a different level of what we call uncertainty tolerance. And there's a... a unclear in the literature whether this is a state or a trait. Um, there's mixed evidence on how this varies by our demographics. It's really not consistent across uh, age, gender, race. And I think personally that it's probably a little bit of a mix of, of both, that there's probably some trait component to what your uncertainty tolerance is, but then it varies by the state that you're in as well. But what this, what this all equates to is that a patient experiences a symptom or a health event, their uncertainty exceeds their personal threshold that they can tolerate, and they seek care. And if we are not able to lower their uncertainty below that threshold, even if we're not able to provide them an ultimate answer, if we're not able to lower it, they could just continue in this care-seeking cycle over and over and over again because we have not met their need. And from the patient perspective, from some of our qualitative work, what this looks like are these quotes. I just hope I look more desperate. So they would really test whatever needs to be tested. Something has to pop up this time. I just truly need a diagnosis. I can't walk out of here with, well, we don't know for sure. Or they just put chest pain and I'm just lost. Like, okay, well, what did they find? They just leave you lost. Like they take care of you, but they leave what's wrong with you between them instead of sharing it with you. And this matters because we don't want our patients to leave with fear. We don't want them to leave you know, being afraid or worrying. It also matters because oftentimes the patients lose trust in us. They lose trust in um, if we're hiding something, if they were believed, and if they need more tests. And lastly, they don't 
oftentimes have a way to address the symptoms going forward while they're waiting for their next point of care. This happens in a third of all emergency department visits. 37% of our patients are discharged without a pathologic diagnosis. So that means they come to the emergency department with a complaint of chest pain, and we discharge them three or four hours later with a diagnosis of chest pain. And we feel really good about that evaluation because we know as the physicians that we've ruled out all kinds of really bad and dangerous things, and there's probably not a way in our system that we could reduce their uncertainty further, but we haven't necessarily relayed that to the patients. And upon discharge, the current state of a high quality discharge is, is uh, measured by giving a patient a discharge diagnosis, explaining to them what their expected course of illness is, and explaining what their treatment plan is. And you can imagine that this is pretty easy when you have a diagnosis. So say somebody has uh, cellulitis or a skin infection. You can tell them you have cellulitis. I'm gonna give you antibiotics for five days. I think things are gonna start clearing up within about 48 hours. Keep taking those antibiotics, complete the full five days. If this, this or that happens, come back to the emergency department. But how do you have that conversation when you don't have a diagnosis? Um, it really impairs our ability to give them a high quality emergency department discharge if you only have a symptom-based diagnosis. So what we've seen from some of our um, audio recording work is that how this often ends up looking is a patient, your doc will go in to discharge a patient and will say, I've got good news. All of your tests are negative. There's nothing going on today. You're okay to go home. I'm gonna call on some audience involvement. What, what's wrong with that? Pick on some of my residents. Yeah, so for the people online, the, the response was that we, we didn't address what they came in for. The patient has real pain and real symptoms and we, we didn't talk about it at all. Um, a couple of other things that we learned from patient-centered work is that it's not necessarily good news to them, um, that they, they were seeking an answer. Um, and when you say things are negative, negative is just a bad word from a health literacy standpoint, it should be normal. Um, and that, that when you say there's nothing going on today, it minimizes the, what they were feeling, the, the fear that they were feeling that drove them to come to the emergency department. Um, so we'll talk more about all of those in a little bit, but you can see the, the challenges here with discharging people when you don't have a diagnosis. But we, we set out to see, was there, was there a need? Was there an educational need around this? And we did a national survey of emergency department trainees and found that nearly all had challenges in discharging patients with diagnostic uncertainty. And the majority wanted more formal training on this. So at this point, we sort of knew from the literature that this was a common problem. 37% of patients uh, discharged with uncertainty. We knew from qualitative work that this was an important problem, important to patients and that their needs aren't being met. And we knew from our uh, survey that there was an educational need around this. So we started to conceptualize of uh, this idea that this is an everyday conversation that we have that is difficult to, and that there is a lot of focused training on these difficult conversations, things like uh, getting informed consent, breaking bad news, finding out somebody's code status, but there wasn't any training that existed for this everyday conversation that I'll probably have you know, six times tomorrow afternoon when I work in the ED. Um, and so at that point, we decided to seek funding for this line of work. And I'm gonna switch gears here and talk a little bit about the grant that we had from ARC to develop communication strategy. So this was an R18 um, from AHRQ and our aims are listed here. Our first goal was to define the key principles of uncertainty communication competency. Our second aim was to develop a simulation-based mastery learning curriculum to teach that communication skill. And the third aim was to test the efficacy of the curriculum in getting trainees to competency um, on communicating about uncertainty. Uh, I wanna pause for a second before I dive into the meat of the grant to 
make a few important distinctions. Um, that, that first and foremost, our goal is not to eliminate uncertainty. Um, as emergency physicians, every time we discharge a patient, we feel like we have already maximally reduced the uncertainty with the resources that are available to us and that that patient is safe to go home. So there's not necessarily more that can be done in that moment to reduce or eliminate uncertainty. The goal was rather to manage uncertainty and to help patients feel safe going home. And second, we structured all of this uh, as a discharge checklist for study measurement purposes, but ideally this is a conversation that starts well before discharge. The other point I'll make is that it is very difficult to script physicians. Um, people don't like being told exactly what to say or how to say it, but people do like having tools in their tool belt um, to address problems. And we see this in a lot of different uh, communication um, aids uh, with mnemonics or shared decision-making tools or checklists. And so that's why we chose to design our intervention as a checklist, that it was uh, uh, something that could be viewed almost as a procedure. Here are, the, here are the boxes you need to check. And lastly, I wanna talk about the educational framework that we used. Um, you see here the sort of traditional bell curve where the, the bulk of the people are in the middle in the, in the C bucket. But who wants a C plus doctor? You know, who wants somebody who's C plus doing your surgery or sticking a needle in your back for a lumbar puncture or communicating to you about uncertainty? And in order to address this, there's this concept that um, you may have heard of it, other of these IFAM talks, because we have a lot of expertise in this at Northwestern. There's this concept of simulation-based mastery learning, which takes the traditional educational framework of a pre-test education and a post-test. And instead of it ending with a pass versus fail, it ends with a pass if you achieve the mastery level, if you get an A, or the opportunity for additional practice if you do not get mastery. And you just continue to practice, practice, test, retest until everybody achieves mastery. And ultimately, this ends up with a new curve, a J curve, where you have a bunch of A plus doctors instead of some C doctors. And the idea here is that it may take people a different amount of time or a different amount of practice to reach mastery, but that ultimately everyone is capable of it. So with that in mind, um, for our first aim, we were uh, developing our uncertainty communication checklist. We uh, did this through uh, getting input from a lot of different people. We did focus groups across multiple sites. Uh, we had an international expert panel and a lit review. Um, we developed a, a methodology um, to identify patients using the UMLS within um, the electronic uh, record that you'll see referenced there, and um, got input from these patients who were discharged uh, within the last week with uncertainty. Um, ultimately, some of the quotes that we heard were that patients want to be heard, they want to be acknowledged, they want a path forward, um, even if we can't get them an answer. And I'll just give you a second to read these quotes rather than reading them all aloud for you. From that, we developed uh, a 21 item checklist that uh, using this patient-centered approach, um, a lot of the items on here are sort of mundane to good communication at diagnosis. They're not necessarily unique to the context of uncertainty communication. Um, for example, we want people to provide results and uh, give opportunities to ask questions. Um, so I'm not going to go in depth on all of these items, but um, the sort of unique elements to the uncertainty communication checklist uh, are these five items. Um, the first was to reassure. Um, and patients specifically wanted reassurance that nothing dangerous or life-threatening was happening. 
they really did not like the terms of serious or emergency. Um, like, don't worry, there's nothing serious going on today or good news, you're not having an emergency because those minimized things for them and made them feel dismissed. Um, like uh, they should maybe have not come here in the first place, uh, as opposed to acknowledging that this was serious to them. This really did feel like an emergency to them and validating um, why they came in the first place. The, the second unique component was that they wanted an honest statement uh, and a very direct statement of we don't know what's causing your symptoms or we do not have a diagnosis for you here today. Um, from our prior work of doing recordings of these uh, conversations, there's a, a, a number of um, probably the majority of conversations had some implicit acknowledgement that there may not be a diagnosis but it was very infrequent that people would explicitly come out and say, I don't have an answer or I don't have an exact cause for your symptoms. And so um, patients wanted that, um, you know, clearly signposted rather than subtly slipped into the conversation. Uh, they wanted their symptoms to be validated and uh, in some ways to normalize the experience of leaving the emergency department with uncertainty. Uh, because otherwise there's this feeling of they weren't believed um, and maybe that's why we didn't get an answer or a feeling of, oh my God, I'm the only one that this is happening to. How can every other person come to the emergency department and get an answer? And I, this always happens to me. I'm the only one. Um, and so if you normalize that for patients and explain to them that, you know, really this is very common in the emergency department that we don't find an answer that helped the conversation. And that sort of naturally segues into the next item, which was the role of the emergency department. Because I think a lot of patients don't understand uh, what we have access to in the ED in terms of testing capability um, and what our resources and, and what our, our real objective as emergency physicians is. And so when you tell them you don't have an answer, they may be thinking, well, why can't you get an answer? Why can't you get XYZ tests? But explaining the role of the emergency department uh, is helpful in that conversation. And lastly, um, and, and this is the item that probably met with the most um, skepticism initially from trainees was to uh, specifically address unmet needs and to open the Pandora's box of uh, what what specifically were you expecting? And um, the reason that this is on there is that people often have very, very specific expectations. They, they may think that they need to see a neurosurgeon or that they need an MRI. And unless you learn that expectation from them, uh, if they leave without you having addressed it, they will just think that they had a bad doctor. Um, and that doctor at Northwestern didn't give me an MRI and I really needed one and I'm going to go back and hopefully get another doctor or I'm going to go to Rush or Loyola, et cetera, because I really need an MRI. But if you open this Pandora box and you ask them, what else were you expecting? Were there other tests you were, you were hoping to have done today? And they say, I wanted an MRI. Then you can say, well, sir, I'm sorry, in the emergency department, we only do MRIs for spinal cord injury and stroke. We don't do MRIs for knee pain, but let me tell you how I can get you connected to get an MRI. Um, and you can kind of cut off that, that cycle. So from there, we, uh, we went through a, a standard setting process to determine what was passing on this, on this checklist. And we used sort of the standard methodology that they use from simulation-based mastery learning. But normally, uh, when defining a standard for a checklist, uh, only experts are engaged in the standard setting. And so we had a novel addition to this study of also having patients engaged in the standard setting. Um, and they, they set the bar pretty high that you had to get 19 of the 21 items on this checklist um, to, to be considered mastery. 
Then we went on to aim two, which was focused on developing our curriculum and developing the simulation that we would use to test this. Um, we undertook all of this development, trying to be mindful of health literacy and working memory constraints and building in uh, ways for the clinicians to address those as well when they were talking through the different items on the checklist. So thinking about using universal precautions, plain language, uh, confirming understanding, and thinking not only about what they were saying, but how they were saying it, the process skills. Well, ultimately this uh, ended with an uncertainty communication education module, the USEM, that has an online course, a uh, mobile app and deliberate sim, deliberate practice simulation sessions. Um, so our online course had um, a lot of different parts to it, audio clips, these matching games. Um, our mobile game uh, was, uh, the, the context of it was that there's a, um, a doctor robot that you have to teach how to communicate. And so it was uh, a, a series of choice options between which is the better uh, approach for communicating this concept. And we developed a total of 16 different uh, simulation cases because we did not want this to be um, an intervention where we were teaching people to be really good at communicating about chest pain or really good at communicating about back pain. Um, we wanted this to uh, cover a range of scenarios and a range of different emotional states and responses from the simulated patients. Um, because it's much easier to have this conversation with somebody who is fairly easily reassured than with somebody who is nervous or is asking a lot of questions. From there, we uh, trained standardized patients and we made a number of videos to enable uh, the dissemination of this curriculum to, so that other people could train them as well. And at the end of the day, what we hope that this looks like is a much smoother discharge process uh, where it you know, doesn't, doesn't start with um, good news, everything is negative, but instead um, walks patients through the summary of the results, explicitly acknowledges a, a lack of a diagnosis, talks to them about their next steps and follow-up, um, and talks to them about where their home care, reasons to return, and answers all of their questions. So. From there, now that we had all of these tools developed, we uh, tested this uh, uncertainty communication education module um, with residents here at Northwestern and at Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia. And these are our methods and results papers. Um, the results were just published in medical education a couple months ago. We had a two-arm waitlist controlled uh, randomized control trial. The first group received immediate access to the uncertainty communication module, and the second group uh, received delayed access. And the residents came and discharged the patient uh, in a simulated setting. The primary outcome was achieving mastery on the uncertainty communication checklist, which, as we mentioned earlier, was defined as uh, 19 items. So we had 110 eligible residents um, and ultimately 109 were randomized uh, evenly to the two groups. The baseline test uh, was prior to any training. And then the first group received the intervention and completed the second test, which is where our primary outcome was measured. They then uh, waited uh, several months and came back for a third test where we measured retention or decay of the skill. And in that same time interval, the second group received the intervention and had their first post-test. Um, the demographics of our group were very similar to the demographics of emergency physicians nationally, 63% uh, male, 72% um, uh, Caucasian, um, 29 years old. And not surprisingly, uh, we found that the people who were trained did much better. Um, so the odds of achieving mastery, if you had trained, uh, were 31.1, odds ratio 31.1. Um, and this is sort of a classic uh, display for mastery learning curricula uh, results display. 
well, you'll see that the, um, the black dots represent those who had immediate access to the curriculum. The white ones are those who had delayed access. Um, at baseline, oh, wrong button. Um, this is the uh, baseline testing here. They were very similar between the groups. Then um, the post-test, this is the group that was uh, had received training. And this is the uh, delayed access group after they received training. And then ultimately, um, both groups continued to train and retest uh, just to you know, fulfill the mastery learning curriculum um, goal of getting everybody to mastery. And it, it took different amounts of time for different individuals, but ultimately everybody was able to reach mastery. We uh, have disseminated this fairly broadly. We have um, the uh, checklist, we have eight ST training videos, 16 cases. Um, we've had nine publications come out of this, this three-year grant. Um, and so we, we viewed the trial as a success with um, you know, seeing that the intervention worked. We viewed our dissemination as a success, um, but we still um, think a lot about you know, what, is, what is real success. Um, we have not yet measured translation into clinical care. Um, and that's our next step that we have a couple of grants under review for right now. Um, we have heard from trainees who've under, undergone our curriculum that using this in practice makes their conversations uh, go more smoothly um, and that they feel more prepared for these conversations. They have less, um, less angst about them, but uh, we have not yet measured patient outcomes. And what we hope happens is that patients feel reassured and cared for, they feel believed, um, they understand the limitations of an emergency department visit, and that they know what to do next and who to seek care from next. Um, but as I said, we're, we're still in the, the next step of uh, actually measuring these outcomes in clinical practice. I'm going to pick on, did any of you guys in the audience, were any of you part of this curriculum? Do you want to share it? We have we have two people here who were part of this. Do you guys want to share at all what your experience with it was? Oh, we'll get you a mic. Hi, uh, I'm a fourth year resident. I did this my interning. Um, super helpful. I have really, the skills I learned as a student on this basis and felt like I taught my juniors as well. A lot of the skills that I picked up on this. Um, I was a little delayed group, I think, way back when. Um, but it was just a really good framework to help, not, not a script, but like a framework to help my conversations with patients. I found even leaving encounters where I'm discharging patients with uncertainty uh, that I felt better as a clinician talking to these things. Thank you. I totally agree. I think I did this as a two or a three it's a couple years ago um it's easily one of my favorite sim experiences and it's such an important skill that I use every single day and I think your point that we do get a lot of training in difficult conversations and this is often not thought of as one but we use it easily the most frequently. Um, and I think back to this simulation all the time and try to employ those skills on shift as much as I can. And I totally agree with Rafa. Not only do patients feel better, but I feel a little bit better too, selfishly. Awesome. Thank you. And they were not plants. I... <laughs> Um, you know, that, that, that for me is another success, you know, hearing this and, um, and sometimes when I'm on shift and I'm in the room with a resident and I hear them using some of our terminology, I'm like, all right, it's, it worked. It's still working. Um, so, you know, we, we're still, we're still exploring this we, as I said, we have two grants under review, uh, looking at some next steps on this, um, 
I just want to spend the the last couple of minutes talking about the the concept of diagnostic uncertainty versus uh, diagnostic error. Um, the there's a recent um, AHRQ report on uh, diagnostic errors in the emergency department. Uh, it was a systematic review that was commissioned by ARC and conducted by a team at Johns Hopkins, and what they found or how they how they di uh, defined error was the failure to establish an accurate and timely explanation for a patient's health problem or communicate that explanation to the patient. And if you think back to sort of how we define diagnostic uncertainty, that based on this definition, a lot of the these cases that we send home with symptom based diagnoses could be considered in error. Um, the, the ARC report found that overall diagnostic accuracy is high. Uh, they said 5.7% of patients receive an incorrect diagnosis and 0.3% suffer a serious harm. And that there were a handful of conditions, um, stroke, MI, uh, aneurysms and dissections, uh, basically aortic pathology, um, spinal cord pathology, and VTE that account for the majority of the serious misdiagnosis related harm. To put this in context, similar reports, similar methodology in other settings had pretty similar error rates. So it makes you think that we as emergency physicians are probably doing a, a pretty good job, especially given that we have no relationship with these patients, that we're seeing them for you know, minutes to hours rather than days or years. Um, but then you see the infographic that ARC puts out with this, and it's pretty damning. And then you see the headlines that followed and the news stories that followed, estimating that we have 7 million incorrect diagnoses in the ED every year and that 250,000 people die every year because of misdiagnoses. For context, ARC has since started to try to claw back this report. Um, this 250, there, there was sort of a uproar from the EM community and the research community criticizing the methodology. The majority of the studies that they used to draw these conclusions were uh, based in other countries. The st single study that they used to extrapolate 250,000 deaths in the US annually was based on a Canadian study that's more than a decade old in which one person died. Um, and so ARC now has that report under review, but this story is still out there. These headlines are still out there. and. AHRQ, or uh, all of the emergency medicine organizations kind of banded together and put out a statement that really reflects a lot of what we talked about today, that emergency care is less about arriving at a final diagnosis. And in many cases, we provide a preliminary diagnosis, knowing that more time and investigation will lead to a final diagnosis. And that we often make a diagnosis that is really a symptom. And to suggest that a diagnosis made in the ED is an error when the ultimate admitted diagnosis differs is a misrepresentation of the practice of EM. So this has caused um, me and uh, my colleagues who work in this space to, to kind of reflect on, is a symptom-based diagnosis an error? And what is our goal as emergency physicians? Is our goal to get a patient a final diagnosis or is our goal a safe disposition? And I think this target lands on the safe disposition side of things. And I think probably most emergency physicians would agree. But I also think that having this conversation and acknowledging the lack of a final diagnosis and clearly talking to patients about next steps is a part of having a safe disposition. And that I think that's a missing piece in a lot of the conversation around diagnostic excellence and diagnostic error in the emergency setting. So with that, I will uh, just wanna acknowledge my, my colleagues on our HRQ team, our patient and stakeholder advisory board and our ARC panel, and uh, mention if anybody is interested in collaboration that this is kind of a hot topic for funding right now. There are two new um, R01 and R18 opportunities from HRQ that just came out. The Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation just announced a diagnostic excellence initiative. 
ARC just funded 10 centers for diagnostic uh, safety excellence across the country. So this is a, a hot topic and in emergency medicine, there's a lot of room for improving the measurement of diagnostic excellence. Um, and if anyone's interested in collaborating, please reach out. With that, I'll take questions. Yeah. Yeah, what, so right there from the resident's experience, you know, what level of training goes to this kind of conversation? Better this will interest. They have the technical advantage of segregation as should you begin a fundamental conversation? Because if it links to some of those medical training, they get reinforced in practical reality and make sense. It would be nice to think it over time. Or do you think this is something that should be started to train? Uh, so the question for those online is, uh, at what point in training should this occur? Um, I, I think that it probably should start it at the medical school level. Um, and we have we have uh, integrated this into the M4 uh, curriculum here with just a one hour session um, as they're you know rising into their M4 level. Um, and at Jefferson, it's also now integrated into the medical student level, and we have a couple of other papers on that. Um, the I, I do think, though, that there probably needs to be some residency-specific kind of retraining on this uh, once you have the, the skills and knowledge in the specialty to really understand the nuance of what diagnoses you've ruled out and ruled in, et cetera, that are specific to your specialty and are based on having a good fund of knowledge in your specialty. Any questions online? No? Okay. What about my nursing colleagues? Thank you for coming. How does this resonate from the nursing perspective? Yeah. Yep. So the the questions were how long do these conversations takes take and are we measuring patient satisfaction? So in answer to the first question, I have found that since having this framework and approach to these conversations, that they're way faster than uh, conversations in the past. You sort of have this this framework, you approach it with confidence, you um, you can anticipate a lot of the questions before they are asked. And as I said before, that I, I try to set up this conversation from the beginning of the visit, that after I uh, see and examine the patient and I'm telling them their plan, I start to lay the foundation for many times in the emergency department, we do all these tests and everything comes back normal and we still don't have an answer for what's going on. And if that happens, I'm gonna come back and talk to you about what it means and what the next steps are gonna be. And you've already kind of reset their expectations at that point from the expectation of, I will get an answer to the expectation of, I will find out that there's nothing dangerous going on. Um, so I, I find that these are three to five minute conversations, maybe. Um, and are we measuring patient satisfaction? We have a we have a grant under review to measure a lot of different outcomes um, related to um, satisfaction, recidivism, knowledge, um, a level of uncertainty. Um, but we are awaiting funding. So, yeah. That was Jackie Kidd. Um, I'm an OT by training, and we often rely on MDs to have difficult conversations with patients while maintaining optimism for recovery. For example, we fail to provide realistic functional expectations post-stroke, for example. Would you make any recommendations for training for allied health professionals in order to support MDs or share responsibilities in these conversations? That's great and tough question. Um, I mean, I, I think that... Um, that a lot of the same tenets of uncertainty communication probably apply, you know, acknowledging where there is uncertainty and where there's going to probably be continued uncertainty and what setting or what the timeline for getting answers might be. Um, 
I think that it, the the OT context is one that I'm not nearly as as familiar with. So I'm sure there are other nuances, and that a lot of this would probably fall more in the the setting of sort of prognostic uncertainty rather than diagnostic uncertainty. So there are probably some other nuances there, um, but I think the, a lot of the same kind of tenets probably apply. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so uh, it's interesting. One of the things that jumped out in moving there from a technical transactional thing to a bit of a relationship, understanding the patient's concerns, understanding and, and, and to put them with that dialogue. So the protocol brings us back to establishing a relationship that's helpful. And the other thing in this question is you're very interesting. Patients with chronic pain, it's kind of like the bane of emergency has to be existed. But but parallel research shows that the correct caring compassion actually meaningful to the patient and then also um, helpful for the Decision and that I uh, exit the patient, but it has to be a genuine start of caring. But it seems like in this the stroke patients, like it first starts with just understanding this, understanding the patient's fears and concerns, their fears and concerns, and then providing some some sense of um, path forward and, and and also um, both. And I, so it's a very interesting model because it gives a model to remind us as emergency physicians to validate the patient, to listen to their concerns, and establish a human relationship. Which also then helps us because there's so much burnout in the emergency and uh, it gives a path of appreciation. So, but that, that sense of relationship and appreciation. Great. Danielle? One great follow up your comments. Um, I, I know you have a plan, so I'm tending to measure out of the um, I assume that's primarily the now. Are you going to measure the satisfaction of our own sports budget? Is that what you were mentioning? This is a, a mutual relationship in the position of the board, the first position of the board, taking care of the patients more comfortable, that's also recognized by the, by the patient. But I wonder. If you could, if you have, and then you're planning to measure, basically what the two of you just said, there's this very positive feedback there. Yeah. Um, and if how you're thinking about it going forward. So in in this grant uh, that I just spoke of, we measured um, very very kind of uh, superficial level experience in the you know three months after you were trained. Uh, how often did you use this? Uh, did you find it helpful? Give us some anecdotes. And we had overwhelmingly positive um, experiences with it. Um, we, uh, for the grant that we have submitted, we actually don't have that piece in there, but I do, I do think that it is important, particularly with emergency medicine being such a, a high burnout um, specialty. Um, I think uh, one of the things that we've also thought about it is that Having this framework just gives a gives a scaffolding that is uh, kind of reduces the cognitive load on the provider for having this conversation. You you have these buckets, these items that you're going to hit. It just makes it that much easier. And the more ways that we can seek to reduce our cognitive load in the emergency department, the better. So. Yes. Uh, that's a great question. So the question was about the the role of uncertainty as a motivator, not uh, only for driving visits in the first place, but potentially as a motivator for changing your health practices to try to prevent uh, needing to come to the emergency department or being in that situation in the future. Um, it's not something that I had, had thought about previously. I think that it probably ultimately depends on um, 
this sort of state trait distinction of people's uncertainty tolerance and that there are, um, I think, you know, anecdotally, there are probably some people that are so scared by the occurrence of an emergency department visit and that these, you know, scary diagnoses were even on the table for them in the first place that they may be motivated to change whatever behavior, exercise more, eat healthier, go and see a primary care doctor. Um, but I think there are probably other people who are just sufficiently reassured that like, this wasn't the big one. I'm good. I'm going home. Um, but hopefully, you know, as we are discharging them and setting them up for their next stages of care, I think that the continued uncertainty may be a motivator for them getting established in care or completing the, the, the kind of really proximal follow-up appointments, even if it's not a motivator for like long-term health change. Yeah. Any final questions? Great. Thanks so much, everybody. Thanks to everybody online.